the platforms and remember we are live and interactive uh, this evening for those of you who are connected with us on facebook feel free to share your thoughts with us the vice president gave a verdict of his account of the state of the economy and then also diagnosing where we are now uh, in terms of the economic performance of the country and the crisis at hand and his prescription of what has led to this crisis well we have some stakeholders reacting to this and all the things that he talked about we'll focus on it tonight here on focus and also remember we'll get some reactions from the general agriculture workers union gao as well who have raised concerns about the vice president's attribution of the fertilizer shortage primarily to the russia ukraine conflict they have questions about that they are with us in studio this evening here on Business Focus. We have all these and more. We have also a former Deputy Finance Minister in the first term of the Kufuadu administration. Currently, he's a chair of the Finance Committee of Parliament. The Honorable Kweku Kwating is with us this evening. Also, John Jenapo, who is a ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament. Also himself, a former Minister of Energy in the XWAL Muhammad administration would also be with us this evening. So we have a strong lineup to also take into consideration your concerns on business focus. We will be back shortly after this quick break. I'll take a quick recap of some of the stories that made headlines over the last seven days. Senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, Dr. Ijapoma Jekedako, has indicated that over the years, the country has not worked hard enough to build a remarkable and resilient economy. According to her, the current government and the past ones have not been able to come up with resilient economic measures to help the economy withstand domestic and international shocks. The government of the United Kingdom has announced a £35 million support program towards the effective implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Area, after agreement, the UK government's fund support for the trade pact was announced by Anne Marie Travoyan, UK's international trade secretary. Oil prices dropped more than $2 barrel on Monday, following a second straight weekly decline after world consumers announced plans to release a record volume of crude and oil products from strategic stocks and as China's lockdowns continued. The market has been watching developments in China where authorities have kept Shanghai, a city of 26 million people, locked down under its zero-tolerance policy for COVID-19. There's more business news on 3news.com. We'll be back shortly after this quick break. We're getting to the conversation this evening here on Business Focus. My name is Alfred Okonsi. Stay with us. Welcome back to Business Focus on TV3. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSV channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. The vice president spoke indeed, and uh, for as long as we are a part of or an import led economy, whatever happens globally will affect us as a country. But can the global situation be blamed for all the local problems and challenges that we have? Those are some of the questions that came out of the vice president's presentation. But first of all, let's start off with the fertilizer and, and the agri sector that you talked about. Let's take a listen to the vice president specifically on the impact of the Russian-Ukraine war on the availability of fertilizer in the country. Take a listen. Here in Ghana, 60% of our total imports of iron ore and steel are from Ukraine. Russia accounts for some 30% of Ghana's imported grains, 50% of flour, and 39% of fertilizer. So we are directly affected by the Russia-Ukraine war. So that's the vice president there, that indeed we're directly affected by the Russia-Ukraine war, which is obviously a fact, because we import. But is it to blame wholly for the situation of fertilizer shortage in this country with this attendant impact on the farmers and then also the farm produce, which eventually leads to an increase in the price of food stuff on the market that you and I will have to buy? I've been joined in studio by Edward Karewa. He's the General Secretary of the General Agriculture Workers Union, GAO. 
And then also, let me acknowledge on, on Zoom, um, Mr. John Jenapo. He is the ranking member of on Parliament Mines and Energy Committee, a Deputy Minister of Power himself uh, in the Exwa Mahama administration. Uh, Mr. Jenapo, good evening to you. Hey, good evening. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you clearly. Thank you so I'm much. Far away in the, I'm far away in the constituency, so I've had to pack somewhere to Great. the Grand Day Fantastic. It's good that you, you're able to join us. Let me also acknowledge Mr. Koko Kwating is, is a, mem a member of parliament as well and also the chair of the Finance Committee of Parliament himself as well, a former Deputy Finance Minister in the first term of the Nanado Dankwa Ekufuado administration. Mr. Kwating, good evening to you. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good evening and good evening to our viewers and listeners. Great. Mr. Kwating, so... You, you heard the vice president uh, talk about the Russia-Ukraine war and the, its impact on the fertilizer availability. Let's understand this. Before the Russia-Ukraine war, which started about seven weeks ago, what was the situation with fertilizer availability in the country? Well, let me also thank the panelists, other panelists that are on the program, and then our viewers as well. Um, I, I think that the, the situation was clear. Um, fertilizer ability, uh, availability uh, was okay. not... Mr. Garrett, hold on a bit for me. Hold on a bit for me. We, we'll correct your, your sound. But let me bring in um, Mr. Uh, John Jenapo quickly. With a clear understanding of what the situation was, especially because you had the a great minister coming before parliament... Uh, the monies were approved for him to go and pay these companies that were supplying fertilizer to the country. Some of them had stated publicly that they were owed by government. Can the situation of the lack of fertilizer now be blamed wholly on the Russian-Ukraine war? Mr. General Paul? I think that the, the Russian-Ukraine war is just started. It's just about one month. And so it will be very difficult to assess the full impact of the Russian-Ukrainian war. But from the economic side, if you look at the uh, data, and especially the summary of economic and financial data from the Bank of Ghana, and if you look at that, it was published in March. And that March report covers up to the end of February. The Ukrainian war started in February. And so if you look at most of the indicators, even before the Ukraine war, we're having a major, major challenge. For instance, our net reserve was about 8.3 billion in August 2021, 2021. Now, even before the Ukrainian war, we've depleted that by about 3 billion. And even before the Ukrainian war, you saw the currency really falling. If the currency falls, it makes the cost of fertilizer very, very expensive. It makes the cost of fuel very, very expensive. And so, yes, the Russian-Ukrainian war would certainly and is certainly having an impact on the global economy. The only thing it has, done, it has done for me is to exacerbate the situation. But even before the Russian-Ukrainian war, the country was going through very, very turbulent times. Inflation had reached 15%. The CD had depreciated about 14.7% against the dollar. Petroleum prices had gone above 50%. And so clearly, you cannot blame the Ukrainian war solely on the woes of the economy. When there is a pandemic like COVID, when there is a problem like the Ukrainian-Russian war, it affects all countries. So yes, it could affect things like fertilizer, especially when you de depend on Ukraine for a lot of your fertilizer. But when it comes to the currency, it affects all countries. And so those with buffers, those that are resilient, they are mm -hmm. able to withstand the shocks. And it does appear that Ghana has not been able to withstand the shocks as far as other countries are concerned. Because this is not specific to only Ghana. It affects all countries. So when your currency is depreciating at a faster rate compared to other sub-Saharan African countries, and I don't always want to go and compare us to like the Western nations, because our peers are Senegal, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda. They are our peers, Cote d'Ivoire, they seem to be doing much, much better than us in terms of their currency. And when your currency falls, 
it cascades and has a, a big impact on the entire economy. And that is why we are really suffering as a country. I'm going to come to you, uh, Mr. Kukua Ting, but Mr. Karawa, you, you were on the path of telling me exactly what the situation was even before the Russian-Ukraine war with fertilizer availability in the country for you, the farmers. Yeah, you know, for the farmers, we didn't even know where the fertilizer comes from. That is not uh, important to us. What is important is first availability of the fertilizer and secondly, uh, the price must be affordable. But prior to even the war, uh, you recall that even in 2021, the Minister for Agriculture came out to say that uh, uh, the, the shortage of fertilizer, that is the subsidized fertilizer to farmers, was as a result of government's inability to pay for supplies that were given to them previously. And because of that, the fertilizer suppliers declined to give them fertilizer. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about availability, the availability can be caused by internal challenges. And then, like in 2021, the lack of fertilizer was caused by the internal challenges. That is government inability to pay for the fertilizers. So essentially, government owed the fertilizer supplying companies. Certainly. And it is not a new thing for me because uh, in business, government cannot always pay uh, upfront for uh, those fertilizers. But what is worrying is when government is not able to pay for the significant, significant debt that uh, they owe them. We have information that as at the time that the fertilizer was not uh, available or when they, those companies were not ready to supply further fertilizer, government had paid less than even 25% uh, of what they owe them. 25%? Yes. So is it, is it the case that the fertilizer companies refused to or could not actually supply fertilizer to you before the Russian Ukraine war because government owed them and was unable to pay enough for them to actually bring in more. You're talking about 25%. Yes, and that, that fact was clearly stated by the Minister for Agriculture on the 16th of uh, July 2021. On the front, front page of graphic, he, he, he made the statement that the Planting for Food and Jobs uh, program was struggling for survival. And his reason why it was struggling for survival was because government was unable to pay for fertilizers that were previously supplied uh, under the planting for food and jobs. So, so, what thing, so, so clearly, with, with this fact from, from the farmers, it, it cannot be the case that with the lack of fertilizer now, it can be wholly blamed on the Russia-Ukraine war, which is just about seven weeks old, and not take into consideration what Mr. Karawet, the General Agriculture Workers Union, the farmers have just told us that before the Russia-Ukraine war, you, government, owed the fertilizer supplying companies so much, they didn't have money to even bring in, and in fact, refused to, to supply fertilizer under the Planting for Food and Jobs program. Well, well, thank you. To start with, I think uh, the media, politicians, everybody, we must have an honest debate about our problems and how we want to solve these problems. Um, it, is, it, is, it is unhelpful when we just like to put issues together for whatever purpose may not be clear. Look, traditionally, there has always been an issue with fertilizer to farmers. There are discussions as to whether the farmers are even benefiting from this, whether the fertilizer is not being smuggled. And if you go back in our history, there have always been shortages here and there. There are many people who believe that government must cut the subsidy to agriculture and find other ways of supporting farmers. I am happy to participate in any debate uh, about uh, fertilizer administration in our economy. But if we want to go into the statement that the vice president issued, I, I, I take it, and we all listen to him. Here in Ghana, some 60% of our total imports of, of iron and steel are from Ukraine. Russia accounts for some 30% of Ghana's imported grains, 50% flour, and 39% of fertilizer. So we are directly affected by the Russian-Ukrainian war. Unfortunately, we do not know when it would end. This is the statement of the vice president. Is it true or not? 
Is Ghana affected by the Russian-Ukraine war or not? It's a question we can answer honestly. And when I listened to Honorable Jinapo, he, he did make the point that, yes, we may have been affected, but it is because somehow we have imported into the discussion an old mm -hmm. issue about fertilizer subsidy and administration in Ghana. When we do that, we never get solutions. So what I would say to you is that I do not think anybody has blamed the shortage of fertilizers in Ghana uh, on Russian-Ukrainian war. If TV3 or anybody sees that, you should point it out to me, and we are happy uh, to respond to that. But as far as I'm concerned, the statement made by the vice president is accurate. In fact, he was not even focusing on fertilizer. He, was, he spoke about oil, uh, iron ore and iron and steel and, and grains and all that. And then make the case that because we import something from these two countries, we are directly impacted by the war. It's a statement that we, I don't think we should really disagree with. But as I said, if you want us to debate the issue of fertilizer subsidy, maybe even we politicians are not the people to uh, be inviting for the debate. Let's hear the technical people. What are the traditional reasons? And it's about time as a country we also considered whether some of these subsidies have to be maintained. It was a... As a result of the subsidy and the issues it creates in the market, there are shortages. And farmers, because they have expectations that government would provide these uh, uh, fertilizers, uh, are beginning to uh, get disappointed and it affects their planning. We need to have a frontal discussion about that. Let's not mix it with the vice president. Well, well, it's because the vice president mentions fertilizer, amongst other things, that Ghana depends on Russia, Ukraine for, and that's why it is within this particular qualification. But you talk about not hearing any person in government make the point that you, we can wholly blame the lack of fertilizer now on the Russia-Ukraine war. I, I'm just saying, maybe no, no, you... No, no. I, 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 said, I said that yeah, when I was invited... Excuse me. Sorry, sorry, yes. sorry. When I was invited for this program, I was told that we were going to discuss the vice president's statement when Indeed. you started. You play the vice president's voice. Indeed. What I'm asking very, very respectfully is that let it not be made to look as if the vice president had implied in any way that fertilizer shortages can be blamed on the Russian-Ukraine war. It has never, it never appeared. If, however, that we want to discuss shortage of fertilizer, why? We are liberty to debate that without going into the vice president's speech, without attributing it to the president. I, I, I'm only saying, he, he made reference to that, but then you've heard other commentary from other appointees of government attributing the shortage of fertilizer now to the Russia-Ukraine war. And, and this is not specifically limited to just the vice president. That's why I'm saying that, yes, indeed, you can have a okay. conversation about the, uh, about the lack of fertilizer, but to the extent that you've had government appointees or functionaries blame the situation now on the Russia-Ukraine war. That's why we needed to clarify from at least the farmer's perspective that it is not the case that you can wholly blame the situation of the lack of fertilizer now on the Russia-Ukraine war, correct? That's what you're clarifying. Yes, and then uh, uh, if you excuse me, the, you know, the whole presentation of the speech of the, pres uh, his, uh, uh, the vice president has implications for, for, for we farmers and not. So when fertilizer is mentioned as one of the uh, major imports from the war zone, that is uh, Ukraine, the, 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 the signal is sending to us is gloomy because if that is the impact, then for this particular year, we are going to have uh, more problems than we've had before. and. Uh, even what we, the challenges that we had before, uh, it's not like the usual shortage of fertilizer here and there. Mm -hmm. It was mainly because government was unable to pay for the supplies that were made already. So the implication is that fertilizer for farmers this year will be far less than uh, I mean what we, we, we had uh, uh, previously. And then that one even dovetails into uh, the Ministry of Agriculture decision to uh, uh, reduce subsidy 
uh, on fertilizer yes. to 15 percent. In fact, for, for the benefit of our viewers, take a look at this. Now, this subsidy on inputs, and Mr. Kukwa mentioned that the government's flagship planting for food and jobs program uh, has been cut for further for the upcoming 2022 crop season. That's a document that we have. The decline in subsidies by government will expectedly impose an extra financial burden on the, on the farmers. Now, it's been cut from 38% to 15%. We'll show it on the screen now for chemical fertilizers and then a reduction, the 40% subsidy on organic fertilizer to 25% in the upcoming 2022 crop season. And that is what Mr. Kariwa is referring to. Mr. Kwating, you talked about a conversation about the whole subsidy regime itself. Um, and I know that for you as a finance committee, to the extent that we spend money to subsidize this fertilizer, what is your view on the decision to cut down the subsidies from 38% to 15%? This is of worry to the farmers. Well, of course, it should be of worry to the farmers. If I were a farmer, I would worry. But you ought to understand that in the year 2020, for instance, government went to parliament to say, give us the chance to spend outside, spend money that we do, we do not have beyond what our laws would permit government to. So parliament gave the permission and government spent, borrowed far beyond uh, the money we could raise because in any event, uh, as a result of uh, the, the pandemic, we're not raising enough revenue. Now, subsequently, it is for the Ministry of Finance to sit down and to see how we go about our fiscal consolidation, namely, how do we go recovering some of the lost fiscal grounds? It cannot be business as usual. Uh, I am not in a position to uh, comment on why the Ministry of Finance did that, and uh, you may want to have a direct discussion with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of Finance for them to show the prioritization in, in the broad economy that may have given rise to what you are, what you are saying. But you know, what I, what I would say is that, look, uh, I, uh, you know, some of us have gone beyond the partisan defense of things and it's about time we settle down and solve the problems of this country. Agriculture farmers, uh, are at liberty to call for these discussions. Mm -hmm. But if the vice mm -hmm. president tells you that uh, some um, amount of fertilizer is, is imported, 39% of our fertilizer is imported, what I would like to hear from the farmers is, do they know whether this is factual? If it is factual, then what we need to do is that now that we are not going to get that fertilizer from that region, how are we going to find fertilizer so our farmers are not worse off? Whether the, the suggestion that is gloomy for us, well, if there's a war and you import 39% of your fertilizer from a country that is at war, of course it's gloomy for you. It's, it's a fact, and uh, I, I don't know why... There was, there's an expectation that somehow government should have hidden that fact. It's important right. that we mention, yeah. we met, uh, I'm closing, it's right. important that we mention it. Then we can have a frank... Can, can I make honest, a point? Let me, let me come in when I finish. We can have a frank, honest discussion about, given that we are not going to get it from Russia, where else can we find it? So that by this discussion, we'll be looking at what other options are available uh, instead of going on about whether the problems existed before uh, right. the, the, the Russian war and all that, I, I think uh, for my colleague, and uh, my colleague and my friend, uh, farmer in the studio, what we should be picking from the vice president's statement is the 39 percent that we are not going to get from Russia. If the figures are not accurate, let let them say it. We can all interrogate and audit the figures and see where we are. If the figures are accurate. The questions we should be asking right now is, so where are we going to get it from? If we can't do that, then we are not really solving the problems of our country and we are not helping our farmers. Mr. Janapo, you wanted to make a point. Can I make a quick point? Yeah, yes. I want to make a point. Kweku, there are two issues here. I beg you, kindly listen to me. The first one is that prior to COVID, there were fertilizer shortages. 
What accounted for that fertilizer shortage is that despite the approval of the budget, government couldn't pay for those expenditure that was incurred by the fertilizer suppliers. Because what they do is that they bring the fertilizer and then you pay them. So for me, that is even the key problem. Yeah. That is a key problem. How come monies have been voted, we are not able to pay for that? When we claim that that program is a flagship program, in fact, what the vice president said, I'm coming to deal with that. But for me, this is the basic one. Now, the vice president says that because we import fertilizer from Ukraine, we have a war. What I expect the vice president rather to be doing is to move forward and then say that because of that, government is doing A, B, C, D. So farmers should get involved and let us solve the problem together. Government must lead the way. Government must solve problems. Government should not just say, yes, we import 39 from Ukraine, there's a war, and leave it there. I expect leadership that because we are not getting the fertilizer, these are the alternatives. Are we going organic? Are we doing some diversification? Are we putting in place some mechanism? Even if not the vice president, the minister of agri should be leading that chart, should be leading the way communicating and reassuring farmers. Now, when you just say that 39 will not come, the danger is that the farmer sitting there says, OK, last year I did five acres. I didn't even get a fertilizer. Now that the vice president says the fertilizer is not even coming, I probably will not do five acres again. I'll just do two acres. So the message can be very, very alarming if he leaves it hanging at that level. I mm -hmm. think that government should quickly rally the people around because food is a basic necessity. In fact, if government wants to cut certain expenditures, agriculture should be the last of them. Let's rather look at other areas and cut expenditures there and rather apply it to the agriculture sector. Especially when you have a pandemic and you have a Ukraine-Russian war, government should rather be increasing expenditure in the agriculture subsector so that at least if we can do anything, as for food sufficiency, we can get food sufficiency to keep going so that when things normalize, we can begin to do the other things that I consider as fanciful. But to decide that you are cutting the subsidy on fertilizer, ultimately what you are doing is that you are going to make agriculture more expensive. And that could have a rippling uh, effect as far as food security is concerned. So mm. I think that we should rather direct the attention towards how to find solutions. Government must lead that chart. Government must review this issue of reducing the amount of money it is allocating to the agriculture sector, i.e. fertilizer and other inputs. Because mm. that, for me, is not a solution at all. I, I want to round up... Uh, if, I, if, I can, if I can quickly make a quick point. Yes. You know, this, uh, this, I agree with Honorable Ginapo in many of the things he has said. And maybe it vindicates the point that on some of these matters, the media should be slow in inviting politicians to, give, to discuss technical matters like this. Look... Uh, the vice president was only making the statement that we've been affected by the Russian-Ukraine war. And then he mentioned fertilizer as one of the things we import from that region. If we want to have a proper debate about uh, the state of fertilizer supply to this country, maybe the technical people who understand that area, or at the minimum, the, the ministers in that area should be debating this. But when we are called and we turn it into a vice president statement and we do that, so, we so don't help our family. Mr. Wating, I'm a technical person in agriculture. Mr. Wating, so you, 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 indeed. I am. You're, you're, not, you're not a technical don't person. Don't you know how to do that? Indeed. 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 Because we don't know. Well, the fundamental reason why if, in fact, yeah. you are even on together with Mr. Janapo, is that you are the chair of the Finance Committee of Parliament. In the end, we will still need money. In fact, if we are subsidizing fertilizer, it's because of some of the attendant problems you have identified. Now, the underlying matter for them, the farmers, is that it's going to impose additional financial burden on them. That affects every other aspect of the economy. So the vice president it talked does. about the yes. economy, yes. right? Yes. Indeed. So uh, that's, that's, I, think, that's... I think you make a good point there. You make a good point there. Uh, we should have a debate. You know, I don't... I have sat at the center of government treasury before. And let me say this, that every interest group... Now, you'll be told that you can't cut uh, allocation to, for instance, supply of fuel to power, because you don't want to do so. Every 
body that benefits from the, the, the national purse would give reasons why DS must not be touched. In the end, it's for the finance ministry to take a holistic view at the economy and to see where we can make savings, given what we had to spend, money we had to spend we did not have in, during COVID and in, in previous times. So my, my simple point is that it's a fair debate. The farmers should make their point. In the end, uh, government would prioritize, and then hopefully that prioritization will provide the optimum outcome for us as a people, and then the effect on all of us will be the optimum. Indeed. I'm, I'm going to take the final word from the farmers. Then we'll zoom into an area of another area of concern as well to both of you and to the Ghanaian people, the issues about the excess power we are paying for, according to the Vice President, contributes to the 50 billion expenditure that we are all having to, to bear as, as a people. So we'll get into that and his breakdown of it and some of the reactions coming from both Mr. Kwating and then Mr. Jinapo as well. Finally, um, yeah. Mr. Karawet, before we go. Yeah, Alfred, the, the, the point here is this. You know, even prior to the, uh, uh, the Vice President's uh, uh, speech, um, the Minister of Agriculture had already gone ahead to reduce the uh, subsidy to, the, uh, to farmers. You know, the question one would ask is, why do we give subsidy? You know, when we started to institute the subsidy, it was for a reason that um, the farmers will not be able to uh, purchase the number of bags that are needed for a particular unit of plot. The, for that matter, there was a need to subsidize. Today, the price of fertilizer has gone up, it is obvious, and then uh, we are also even expecting uh, a, a further rise in the, in, the, in the price of fertilizer as also uh, uh, supported by the uh, Vice President's statement. Now we were thinking that in the midst of all this, when the farmers need a, a, a subsidy the most, it is rather the time that uh, uh, it is being cut. And the overall implication is that it's going to constrain production. Unit pay, uh, uh, I mean, yield pay acre will now fall because there will be low application of fertilizer. Uh, farmers will constrain production, and the overall output of agriculture by 20, by the end of 2022, is likely to fall. And, and food, by 2023, food. this time, we may have a bigger problem in our hands to, to bear. And the food prices as well. That certainly will go up. Uh, Mr. Karawa, Edward Karawa is the general secretary of the General Culture Workers Union with us in the studio. I'll be back shortly after this quick break. We'll zoom into the other aspects of the Vice President's presentation, specifically on excess power that we are paying for, to the IPPs, and that also generated some debate. We'll be back shortly. Welcome back to Business Focus on TV3. We're live on TV3 Ghana on Facebook, DSTV Channel 279, and all across the world on 3news.com. The Vice President gave an indication of three expenditure items that makes up about 50 billion cities of debt to the Ghanaian people that we're paying for. One of it is the payment of the excess capacity that we have to pay to independent power producers. Take a listen to the Vice President. The economy was on the verge of collapse and a legacy of take or pay contracts saddled the economy with annual excess capacity charges of close to one billion US dollars a year. These were basically contracts to supply energy to Ghana way in excess of our requirements, but we were obligated to pay for the power whether we use it or not. We were confronted with a banking crisis, and not dealing decisively with it would have meant disaster for the economy. That was a vice president on the amount of money we're paying to the IPPs for power we are not using. I have back on Zoom uh, Mr. Koku Kwating, the chair of the Finance Committee of Parliament, and then also John Jinapo, who is a ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament. Now, take a look at this on the screen. The, this is an answer to the question that Al-Hassan Sweeney filed sometime last year that the finance minister came to answer 
about the amount of money that we've paid as excess, that's the charges that we're paying for excess capacity to the IPPs. AXA, $347.2 million. And then Car Power, $359 million. Send Power, $231.3 million. Okay. This is according to what the finance minister answered Suhini's, uh, Suhini's question between a four-year period. So then questions were raised about the vice president's attribution to this being the one bill, almost $1 billion being an annual charge for excess capacity. Mr. Kwating, let's get an understanding here that this particular statement by the vice president that we are, as a people, paying almost a billion dollars for excess capacity annually, as against what the vice president, and that's the finance minister said in parliament in answer to Al Hassan Sunil's question last year that within a four year period, we have paid almost a billion dollars for excess capacity. Is it annual charge or a four-year period that the Vice President was referring to? Well, uh, I, I do not think I'm in a position to, uh, to, to answer these numbers questions. The Vice President's statement was clear. The way you read it, that's how I also read it. And we can, as I said, we can always go into the figures and audit it and see which figure was accurate and which figure was not accurate. That is not the point. The point that the vice president is making, which point I have made uh, in the past, is mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we, we politicians, it's about time you stop shielding and pampering us. And not just we politicians. People, let me finish. People yeah, in, Mr. Kwati, you are talking about the fact that it's not about the figures. But for, for us, the citizens and the Ghanaian people who are funding this, this payment, it is about the figures for us. So if the vice president says, for instance, that one billion is spent annually on excess capacity, that's power that we are not using. And then the finance minister is also saying that almost a billion is spent on the excess capacity over a four-year period. We certainly need some clarification, obviously. Because yes, yes, so 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 we can seek that clarification. And 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 uh, if if I knew that uh, it is reconciliation of figures. I would have done that before attending this program, right. you know. But so, but I think it's a it's a fair question you put. We should continue to interrogate and know exactly uh, what, how much we are paying for these SS capacity charges. I, I I think it's a fair debate, and 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 I'm happy you've taken it up. It ought not to end at this program. We can invite the people who are making the payment, the finance ministry themselves, to give us figures. It is, it is entirely possible for me to stand here and to say, because I mean, the NPP, the figures are right and, 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 and politicize it. The point I, what I would like to make is this. As the citizens, the citizens that you talk about are affected by a decision that our own government made, a decision to procure power that we did not need. That is what we call excess capacity charges. I have heard uh, the people who are in power at the time say that they procure that power with the intention to sell. I am here to see the sales agreement that warranted the production of power. I'm here to see that. I have not seen that. The lesson to us, and that is right. the point I think Dr. Baumia makes. I'm closing on this. The right. point Dr. Baumia makes that when, because people want to take it back, they sign contracts that as a people we don't need. It can be one billion, it can be 10 billion, you can reconcile the figures. It is something we must call out people and ensure that not just the people in the NDC administration who might have done that, so that people living in this administration or future MPP administrations will be unhappy doing this because Ghanaians right. will call them out. Why should we pay for power we did not need simply because somebody was in, in, in a hurry to sign a contract? And, okay. and put into the basket power that we did not need. Why should we entertain that? Okay. Mr. Jinnapop, I'm bringing in here at this point, and um, the attribution to what was done previously, you were in that particular ministry um, one time as, as a minister, and then also now a ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament. What exactly is the situation with the excess power that we are paying for?
that we are not using. Yeah, let, let me deal with this. Let me, let me deal with this issue frontal and head. First of all, Kweku, the minister cannot sign you a member of the finance committee at that time. The minister must appear before your committee to seek approval. If you do not give the minister that permission, the minister cannot sign. So it is not the case that somebody just sits somewhere and signed an agreement. Two, I disagree with the vice president completely when he says that those payments were for excess capacity. He was misleading us. And you've just pointed to the contradiction between the vice president and the finance minister. The vice president can hold a political program with Tesco, like he did, and peddle all kinds of figures and bandy, and bundle figures and throw them around. In parliament, it's up for records. So when the Minister of Finance appeared before parliament, he could not do what the vice president was doing. The vice president says we are paying $1 billion annually. The minister says over four years, he hasn't even paid $1 billion. So there's inconsistency there. On the floor of parliament, we ask the minister, this $1 billion that you pay, you paid over four years. Is it for excess capacity or is for power produced or is for fuel consumed? He said he could not desegregate it and the records are checked. The minister himself says that he could not because when ECG buys power from these IPPs, they are unable to pay about 40% of the power bought. So the minister is then called upon to pay for that. That is not excess capacity. Koku talks about an agreement that uh, enables us to export power. Koku, this is an agreement here. I wish I could show it. It's in the night. First demand guarantee between the Republic of Ghana. Unfortunately. The Minister of Finance. Unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately. I'll send it to Koku. We were to export power to Burkina, which would give us so much money to pay for it. We have signed it. We have gotten a facility of $199 million from Ajans France the Development. So the critical would extend their cables to Burkina for us to export about 200 megawatts of power. But quickly, Kweku, right. we talk about take-or-pay agreement. This government has signed a take-or-pay agreement with the LNG under the supervision of the vice president. The vice president is the chairman of the economic management team. They cannot commit Ghana to such an agreement without his approval. That time, LNG project is the most expensive gas project under this vice president. The very plans that he says we did not need. AXA, car power. Right. They extended AXA for five more years. Car power mm. has been extended for right. 10 more years. My final point is that it is not true that there's so much capacity that we are paying for. These are reserve margins that we need as an insurance. A lot of the payments are fuel related. So which means that we are going to be at So which power are you going to be at What do you do when you have a, you have a reserve margin? Right on. Is that you export that reserve margin. When you have a challenge, you cut the export. Let's accept that this okay. is a capacity. Let me just wind up. Uh, right. Kweku, let's accept that the vice president peddled falsehood. That's a bit too late. That's a bit Let's accept that the vice president peddled falsehood. Right on. Okay, indeed. I, I thank you very much uh, for this. But, Mr. Kuku, I think, yes, thank you so much. That, that's right. Would you share with me? Okay. But, Mr. Kuku, I, I thank you as well. I th indeed. I, I thank you as well for your time this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Kuku, I is the chair of the Finance Committee of Parliament. And then also, uh, we have here John General Paul also the ranking member on the Mines and Energy Committee of Parliament as well. And these are the two areas, as I said, we're going to be segmenting the Vice President's speech into many areas that we'll tackle in the coming weeks. So this is the first two areas. My name is Alfred Okonse. This has been Business Focus. Have a good evening.